Belcor is the very first Zeman Prince, and he has a pretty wide spanning lore from some of the earlier editions of 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy, all the way up to 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy, and even currently in Warhammer 40,000. In this video, we're not going to be covering any of his Warhammer 40,000 lore, we're just going to be focusing on his 6th and 8th edition lore, as well as his rules in the Storm of Chaos supplement, and in the special 8th edition battle scroll that was released that goes over his rules updated into 8th edition. And Belcor's history is pretty in interesting. The very first iteration of him in 6th edition kind of talks about this uh, demon prince that was before time was time type thing, right? It kind of goes and harkens back to pre-elves and how Belacor was punished for more or less his hubris in uh, kind of looking down on other mortals because he didn't feel like he needed to lead them. So all of the chaos gods have essentially punished him and said, okay, well, if that's going to be your case, then you can't go into the mortal plane anymore and you can just shake your little demon rattler somewhere else. And it's an interesting situation because... In the 8th edition, we get this battle scroll, this little supplement strictly for Bellacor's rules to be brought into 8th edition prior, or even, I think it was actually, it was 2013, so I think it was around the same time as uh, the Archeon book, but it was a way to really give him a full update into 8th edition, not just simply rules, but the lore, because the 8th edition lore for Bellacor tells a much different story. For him being the first demon prince, we get this story of a gentleman gentleman, huh? Uh, of a, the very first human to become a demon prince. So no longer is this a time before time, before the elves, in which the first demon prince was born. This is the first human to become a demon prince. And through that, he falls to uh, all of the kind of allure of the chaos gods, but at the same time, he goes to trick them. They all offer him gifts, saying, hey, if you take this gift, you can be one of my, um, not necessarily, um, champions but you can be imbued with it more so than any other being in existence remember this is the first demon prince there's not other demon princes let alone chaos champions to share in this power so bellicor essentially tricks the gods and takes uh, the power from all four of them and rebels against them he says no i'm not going to really listen to what you said i'm going to go down to the mortal plane i'm going to do things how i want and when he enters the mortal plane he comes into the exact situation that the high elves the dwarfs and the lizardmen are dealing with with a great cataclysm. The polar gates have fallen. The nascent human race is kind of barely present in the northern portion of the old world. And Belacor is running wild. And what he does here, he is he essentially creates this massive host. And he subjugates the majority of the northern human race, which would eventually become the Norskins and the many marauder tribes and uh, creates this both human and demon host. And he subjugates even other demons into his um, will, more or less, kind of saying, hey, don't 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 listen to Big Daddy Zinch. You're going to talk to me. Papa Nurgle's not that cool. I'm the cool one here. And he does this pretty much leading a massive army of all of these combined forces, right? Humans, demons, everything, against the elves, the dwarfs, and then also the lizardmen. And by doing this, he thinks he's kind of fulfilling his own kind of wishes, right? This is what I want. This is what I want to do. Screw off uh, the other four chaos powers. But unwittingly, he actually ends up doing their bidding because as he's kind of cultivating this human cult for uh, the ruinous powers and their um, worship and encouragement into the ruinous powers actually creates these demon champions and these demon champions i'm sorry these chaos champions uh eventually rise to demon princehood so no longer is bellicor the sole demon prince of the ruinous powers he quickly becomes one amongst many and with each new demon prince born something that bellicor thinks he's doing to strengthen his army he's actually reducing his own strength because some of the power that is given to Bellacor is now borrowed and given to this new demon prince, to this new ascended um, demon champion. Something that he thought was actually bolstering his army, which is a very interesting dichotomy that they created in the 8th edition. And as we push through the, the lore of this at the end of the Great Cataclysm, with the creation of the Great Vortex that sucks all the winds of magic for the most part, well, greatly diminishes the winds of magic for the most part in the, uh, in the world of Warhammer, and all the chaos or demon, demon princes are banished, we get him back in the realm of chaos where he says, hey, 
chaos gods ruinous powers i'm sorry i didn't mean to do what i did i mean i was going through a transitionary period you know i was 17 and i was having a wild time with cocaine and the chaos gods say no we don't believe you and this kind of um, intersects with the sixth edition lore the same punishment that happens in sixth edition is the same one that happens in eighth edition where bellicor is now damned to forever guide the next ever chosen the champion of all four gods to the crown of dominion and this crown gives him that kind of ultimate um power right it kind of says like hey i am now or i'm sorry crown of domination uh gives him that ultimate power saying i am the true champion of all four of the chaos gods i am the ever chosen i have been coronated by bellicor because that's his ultimate punishment is he must lead them to the crown of, uh, of domination and then coronate them as an ever chosen so it's really a huge smack in the face and it becomes this this large issue for the underlying character of bellicor he goes through a lot of many incursions into the old world trying to overthrow the chaos god's plan saying okay well how can i undermine this how can i summon up enough power to finally enter the mortal realm in a corporeal way not just as this ethereal being to guide someone from one location to the next and this becomes um, a repeating motif, right? This becomes the basis for Shadows Over Albion. He is uh, guised as the Dark Master, and he's trying to summon up all of this power from Albion to enter into the mortal realm so he can claim the crown of domination for himself once more and become uh, the champion of the Chaos Gods. But in doing so, uh, Archaon rises to the occasion that he needs... Uh, Bellicor to coronate him, so Bellicor is, boom, he vanishes from Albion to go help out there. And there's a number of other times that this, is, this happens. There's other Everchosens, right? In the 8th edition rules, the Battle Scroll says that he has done this duty, this, this um, coronation, 12 times now has Bellicor fulfilled his destiny as Harbinger, each time attempting to escape his preordained fate, but ultimately meeting with failure. And the 13th Everchosen is Archaon. And we don't really know each and every previous ever chosen, but the very first one was Morkar the Uniter. And this is um, someone that was alive during Sigmar's time. Sigmar and Morkar fought. And then there's uh, Vangel, who is the guy who actually creates the Slayer of Kings, the sword that Archaon uses. But Cardoon, the glorified, is another ever chosen that gets possessed by Bellacor. And this is the closest that Bellacor really gets to claiming the crown of domination. He tries to use all the warp energy in uh, Ordheim to essentially summon up enough power to push him out of Cardoon's body and into the mortal realm. But the chaos gods are fickle and they kind of saw this coming. So they uh, essentially wrapped him up in Cardoon's body and said, nah, no, one, no one's the ever chosen now. So it's very interesting how Bellacor has always been this underlying thread to the Warhammer fantasy lore. And every time there's an Ever Chosen, he kind of gets this moment to be free and kind of uh, pull all the strings that he can to try and unravel everything the Chaos Gods have created. And I think he's a very amazing character. And he's one that really doesn't get enough credit. He wasn't in any of the Warriors of Chaos books. He's not in any of the Demons of Chaos books outside of lore mentionings. He doesn't get rules until 6th edition Storm of Chaos, and then once again in the 8th edition Battle Scroll for Bellacor. So he is this amazing model too. He's probably one of the coolest looking uh, demon models in all of Games Workshop's range. Uh, he's easily the, the coolest looking demon prince. And demon princes are very interesting because if we talk about Warhammer 3, we're going to talk about demons, right? We're going to see them enter into the playing field. But what I really want to see is Bellacor possibly come in at the very end of two. Now, I know that that kind of sounds a little wild, and that's the point of this video. It's supposed to be a speculative kind of harebrained idea. But I think that if we already see Sartoriel as this demon prince that is in a predominantly, well, almost entirely mortal army of chaos, why not Bellacor? Bellacor plays a very huge role in both the end times and the storm of chaos. In the storm of chaos, he actually uh, resurrects Volkmar the Grim and binds him to a banner. And we're going to read that lore blurb from the 6th edition Storm of Chaos supplement in just a little bit. And in 8th edition, he tries to kill the Lady of the Lake and then eventually gets banished by all the incarnates. So Bellacor, again, has this really cool 
um, underlying thread to everything. And I think that when you guys hear the rules that we're about to talk about and you hear more about his lore, you'll also see that I think that this guy could definitely work in Warhammer 2 prior to Warhammer 3's arrival of, of, of Chaos Demons. I mean, I would love for him to be a part of a Chaos Demon army, and I think in 3 that makes a lot of sense. But I just want to see him in the game now rather than later. And then just spruce him up for three. Make him look really cool and tight. Put a new bow tie on Slap, slap, done. I mean, he led the demonic legions in the Storm of Chaos. So this is, again, intentionally supposed to be a pretty speculative, harebrained idea. But I wanted to talk about Bellacor because so many people have asked me about his lore or asked me about his rules. And I think that this is a really cool time to do it. So let's talk about the lore blurb from that 6th edition Storm of Chaos book, then we'll jump into the rules for Bellacor, the Dark Master. Most fell of the creatures of chaos are the demons, spawned from the nightmares of mortals and given form by the raw chaos that pours from the north. Demons are often only fleetingly attached to the world. Random possession, fleeting visions, and temporary incarnations are enough to make them a plague upon the world. Yet, when the realm of chaos yawns wide and the magic spills across the land in invisible waves, the threat of the demon becomes terrible. Legions of unnatural beings break through from their otherworldly realms, their dread voices rising up in praise of their masters, the arcane battle cries and unholy screams and bellows turning men insane on simply hearing them. Such was the force brought forth by Bellacor, also known in recent times as the Dark Master, though he has been known by many names and titles through the centuries and in different lands. First demon prince of chaos, Bellicor's hubris was turned against him and Zinch cursed him to a millennia of insubstantial, maddening existence. For once Bellicor thought himself worthy to lead the legions of the gods in their final conquest of the world, now he was damned to crown the mortal champions of the gods, his heart seething with jealousy and betrayal. That curse was lifted upon the crowning of Archaon, and Bellacor rejoiced in his freedom. A thing of shadow and terror, the Dark Master conjured up a great portal for his ancient armies to march through, accompanied by raucous blaring of horns and guttural shouts of triumph. In the wake of Archaon's advance, Bellacor drove his legion southwards towards the lands of men. It was in the cold, frozen lands north of Kislev that Bellacor was drawn to a certain place, and upon arriving, recognized it as the battlefield upon which Volkmar the Grim had faced down the Everchosen. Frozen corpses littered the bloodied field, half eaten by crows and vermin. In the midst of that deathly, immobile scene, he spied the ruins of the Grand Theogenist's war altar, its trappings broken, and its images of Sigmar cast into the bloodied, frozen mud. Amongst the ruin of the battle chariot were the body of Volkmar himself, Frozen in his final agonizing death throes, a sparkling gash of blood across his chest, and the broken remnants of the Jade Griffin amulet laying at his feet. Sensing a means to assert his superiority over Archaon, Bellacor drew forth his most ancient magics and laid his hand upon the chest of the Grand Theogenist's body. Dark energies coursed from the Demon Prince into Volkmar, and with a shuddering scream, Grand Theogenist's soul was dragged back into its body. Pain flaring through him, Volkmar breathed again, and his eyelids fluttered open. Even the faith of the mighty Volkmar was sorely tested as he looked upon the terrifying apparition that stood before him. He could feel the taint of chaos magic seeping through his limbs, his heart, and his mind. Bellacor had the Theogenist taken up and chained to the battle standard of his legion, from where the agonized cursing and wailing of the priest could be heard and his writhing body seen. While Archeon had merely slain the leader of the Church of Sigmar, Bellacor sought to inflict a lifetime of physical and mental torture upon Volkmar. He would see him broken and weeping and pleading for the forgiveness of the gods for his false ways. Already he owed his life to the dark powers of chaos, and it pleased Bellacor to ponder the tormented thoughts that would plague the priests until his mind was finally broken by it. With his unholy standard marching at the head of the legion, Bellacor headed south once more, pleased with his small victory over his rival. When Middenheim fell, he was sure that it would not be at the hand of the upstart Archeon, but by his own mighty deeds. He would become the true champion of the gods and be restored in their favor, as he was destined to be for the last 3,000 years. What's interesting here is that Bellicor is the only named Mark of Chaos Undivided character in all of Warhammer Fantasy's 
rules uh, as far as um, any character that has gotten a model and or has received um, actual rules for the tabletop. There's been plenty in the actual lore itself, but I'm referring to just strictly rules. And with that, we get a very disgusting character in 6th edition Storm of Chaos. He does get 8th edition rules, but for the most part, they're very watered down versions of his 6th edition. So we're going to be discussing his 6th edition rules with maybe some 8th edition spicing in here. Just to give you a frame of reference here, um, he's a level 4 wizard with the lore of shadow in 8th edition. In 6th edition, he gets his own custom lore called the Master of Shadows. It's really awesome. So we're going to talk about... Um, his Storm of Chaos version more so than his 8th edition. So again, he has a Mark of Chaos Undivided, pretty easy there. Other special rules that he has, though, is Whispers in the Darkness. All enemies suffer 6, or a, min or a minus 1 on all attempts to rally. Enemies within 6 inches of Bellacor suffer minus 1 to any leadership-based tests for that, that they take. I think it's a pretty easy translation. Just have it so he has a constant aura of negative leadership around him. And we're gonna say, I'm going to say why that's going to be really cool when we talk about some of his um, abilities and how they could be possibly, um, I guess, flavored in with his leadership debuffs. Another one he gets is Night Wards. Any spell directed at Bellacor will be miscast on the roll of any double. And I, I think this one's another pretty easy one, that he gets either a passive magic resist or map wide, there is an increased uh, miscast chance on any spell. I think that's a pretty easy translation. And guys, let's just be upfront about this. All of his rules are disgustingly overpowered if we were to put them in each and every one of them, how, how I'm saying it, and even slightly how I'm saying it. They're, they're, they're just disgusting. So in addition, Eternal Terror here, he just simply has the ability to cause terror. Shadow Shroud would give him an additional um, reduction to hit in tabletop, but I could see this as a like a 20 or 30 meter radius reduction to melee attack um, for any unit attacking around him. So he kind of always has this support characteristic to reduce that melee attack, reduce the leadership to from Whispers in the Darkness. I think that this character needs to be pretty scary. Uh, he is the very first Demon Prince. Now he's not no he's not he's no Sartoriel. But Thoriel's uh, pretty weak by comparison. And in the lore, uh, Bellacor at his peak was was pretty jacked. Like his magic ability rivaled both Nagash and or maybe Hashut. And Hashut himself is a demon prince. And Bellacor is the first demon prince. So everyone else is kind of a bit of a carbon copy of, uh, of a Bellacor here. So having a really strong character, yes, it does break a lot of things. And again, this is really just a fun kind of foray through all of his rules. But having him really strong too, I think would be very lore friendly and very in line with how he was supposed to be perceived. But one of his last special rules here is insurmountable rage. And I kind of look at this as almost a bit of a check on his power. And it essentially forces him into close combat and tabletop if, if something's within range for him to charge um, and he fails a leadership test. But it'd be very interesting if he has the chance to rampage um, maybe below 50% a leadership he'll rampage or below 50 percent health or rampage but i think it'd be pretty interesting if they had some sort of um kind of constant effect if below 90 percent health make a check every 45 seconds if failed rampage that is kind of a little rough and i think that it, it is a pretty broken scenario that it would maybe result in this guy rampaging right out the gate and uh oh there goes my super strong character that I spent all these points for in multiplayer where I've been upkeeping my entire game and now he's rampaging and I can't stop him so that might be a little too on the nose here maybe he just simply rampages below 50% health but adding a rampage mechanic to him could be a great way to kind of keep his extreme power in check now he also gets demonic large target and fly which I think would be uh, fair here so um, it would be interesting to see if they were to make Demon Princes in Total War Warhammer 2 at the end, or 3, what would their fly characteristic be like, right? So Arthoriel has got wings, but he just kind of hovers, right? He just has that strider, like, oh, I'm going to scoot above the ground and, and flutter about. So would they eventually have the ability to full-on fly in Warhammer 3, or Bellicor's case, whenever he would come out, if he were to come out? I think that's a pretty big thing that people need to talk about with these demon princes. Are they going to be a flying character? And if so, um, how is that going to really play into their their uh, mechanics? So as far as his spells go, 
That's the other portion of his list. He does have a special weapon called the Blade of Shadows. Bellicor wields an esoteric demonic blade, its ghostly form and internal transience between shape and shadow, solidity and silhouette. Mastery of this weapon enables Bellicor to scythe through armor, scale, flesh, and bone without resistance. Its essence changing in an instant from formless shadow to murderous edge at its master's whim. Whether the weapon is a part of the demon itself, or perhaps an ancient gift bestowed upon him by the dark gods that Bellicor somehow retained in spite of his fall from favor, none can truly say. And this is just simply a magic weapon with no armor saves allowed. Um, it's pretty easy. I think that if they were to give this to him in the game, it would simply have like a 40 or 50 or 60% AP and weapon damage buff if activated. I, I think it's a pretty easy translation here and that's the only magic item he has in both eighth edition and in sixth but uh, again the big thing here is his master of the shadows the following spells that he has he has bolt of dark light nightmare first the dark master fog of death and coils of the serpent this five of the six of the spells that were released for his lore so the first one is a very simple one. Bolt of the Dark Light is just a magic missile. It's just going to do some damage. I just look at this as even a dark colored version of Soul Quench, if you really want to think of it pretty easily on a one to one. And the next spell here is Nightmare. And this really is just essentially a carbon copy of Doom and Darkness from the Lore of Death. You simply make it a nice debuff to leadership, stack it with Whispers in the Darkness on his actual character's uh, uh, ranged debuff to leadership, it could be pretty devastating. Now the next one is Curse of the Dark Master. This can be cast on an enemy unit anywhere on the battlefield. If successfully cast, all models in the unit suffer a penalty of minus one to hit. I think that having that be that anyone on the battlefield, that's a little much. But I simply see this one as reducing melee attack and melee defense in either a specific target or overcasted to be cast in an area around it. Now we see something like this already in the game with some other uh, spells, but I think Curse of the Dark Master is a good one to kind of ultimately be a lot of debuffs. And that's what the Master of the Shadows, or I'm sorry, his lore really focuses on is a lot of debuffs. This next one kind of pays, that, uh, pays respect to that as well. It's called Fog of Death. Now we do get a fog ability in the Vampire Counts, I'm sorry, Vampire Coast lore. And this one I think would be a little bit different. So essentially the way it works in tabletop is that it has a map wide effect and everyone on the map takes damage. But I could see this as simply like a flock of doom, but with the added ability to slow things down. And it would work on both allies and enemies alike. That's the kind of uh, the trade-off you're going to get here. Yeah, it's going to slow things down. Yeah, it's going to do flock of level, flock of doom level damage, but it's also going to slow down and damage your units. I'd say to kind of balance it out here. Otherwise, you're just simply getting a flock of doom. That's just the same thing as uh, like a different colored flock of doom, basically. So that's how I think you could really uh, change that. And the last one is coils of the serpent. This can be passed on a single <clears throat> unengaged enemy model within 12 inches of the caster. The victim must immediately take a toughness test. If failed, the model is crushed to death. So, <clears throat> you know, a uh, pretty scary one. And I, again, I see this as almost like a, a spruced up spirit leech or something like arcane unforging, which arcane unforging had a way different connotation in the lore and they've kind of adapted it pretty well to Total War Warhammer 2. I think Coils of the Serpent could maybe be something like a Spirit Leech with a slowing effect that does heavy AP damage. That could be the kind of uh, way you differentiate it from all the other single target heavy damage abilities that a lot of other lores get. This one would simply slow it down, do a lot of heavy damage to uh, single entities. That would be the primary target here. And it is the highest casting or uh, the highest level spell in the lore itself. So I think it'd be a pretty fun one to, to make a have a little oomph. And I think that having a lot of debuffs on these spells, like the leadership, the melee defense and attack, and the slowing down as well as damage, kind of pays, again, respect to the fact that Bellicor has got a lot of debuffing abilities. And you stack all these things up, I think it could make for a really crazy synergistic lord that can just do a ton of damage, but also neutralize a lot of things that he has to deal with. So Bellicor is... A very interesting character and i wanted to talk about him for a long time but i just wanted to compile all the necessary accoutrement before we did talk about him so i'd love to hear what you guys think about bellacor the dark master i know it's kind of a far-fetched idea to have him in warhammer 2 and i think he's most likely to be in warhammer 3 but 
if we've seen Sartoriel as an example of a demon prince in a mortal chaos, uh, Warriors of Chaos army, then I think Bellacor could fit just fine. And especially if he's that kind of last thing. Like, let's say they did a Warriors of Chaos 2.0 update as a pre-order DLC that added Bellacor, a number of mortal god-aligned uh, Chaos Champions and God-aligned units as that pre-order DLC to bridge the gap between 2 and 3, I think it'd be perfect. If Bellacor was your choice for the Demon Prince and they saved all of the God-specific Demon Princes for the Warhammer 3 Demons of Chaos army, I think it would be just fine, right? Bellacor leads the, the quote-unquote pre-order DLC, which I hate to say, uh, of a Warriors of Chaos 2.0 with uh, ruinous power units and ruinous power champions. I think that would be a, a perfect way to segue into it. And I think that taking a look at some of his uh, special rules and his uh, special lore is a great way to get a good hype or at least a good idea for how this guy could really be brought into Total War Warhammer 2 in a really cool, flavorful way. But as always, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video here today and learned a little bit more about Bellacor, the Dark Master. And as always, please go ahead and like, subscribe, all that kind of action. If you do subscribe, Slap that little bell icon and turn on all notifications. I hate to keep saying it, but I guess that's an important thing to keep bringing up. Um, but if you want to know more about some of these other individuals from the Chaos Pantheon, let me know. I was actually thinking of talking about Engra Deathsword from uh, the cover of, oh man, I think it's the 5th edition Warriors of Chaos or Hordes of Chaos army book. And he plays a huge part in the Great War Against Chaos. Uh, he is one of the... Uh, generals of of the of the ever chosen at the time Asabar Cool, and he is called the Butcher of Prague. So he's a really cool character. I was thinking of doing. So if you want to hear more about these little side characters like this that are kind of off the beaten path, go ahead and let me know in the comments section below. As always, guys. But thanks again for watching. Have a good one and take care.